Uh, hi guys, thanks. Uh, so I'm Tomislav, and like it's been said, contrary to what my surname implies, I'm actually from Croatia. Uh, I'm a JavaScript engineer from Infinum. So let's start with that. Uh, Infinum is an independent design and development agency from Zagreb. We do a lot of applications and sites for the interwebs. Uh, so check us out. Uh, at Infinum, I, I'm part of the JavaScript team. We're a couple of, it's not on? No. Turn it off. Oh, sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so great. So at Infinum, I'm part of the JavaScript team. Uh, we're a couple of individuals that bravely, bravely decided to do JavaScript for a living. And if you want to check out some of our work, you can check it out on this link. Okay, so back to the topic. Uh, today I'm gonna cover some CSS features that are coming to your favorite browsers. Uh, mainly, I'm gonna cover two of the coolest features that I, at least I think are the coolest. Uh, the first one is gonna be the CSS grid, and the second one is gonna be CSS variables, or CSS custom properties as they're being called in the specification. So let's start with the cooler one, the CSS grid. Uh, so first, we're gonna cover grids in CSS in general, in front-end development. So if you ever did any front-end development in your lifetime, chances are near 100% that you encountered some grids at one point. Uh, grids are the fundamental building blocks of every website, whether it's for entire layouts or for some more simpler components such as galleries, let's say. So it's really a bummer that CSS hasn't had the specification for grids earlier. So if you had to do the grids, you had to resort to some outside plugins or grid frameworks, such as Bootstrap, that's probably the most, uh, most popular one, or maybe Foundation, or 960 Grid if you're old school, or Suzy, or anything else. Uh, we at Infinum prefer Suzy. We think it's really cool. Uh, Suzy is actually a grid framework that's made in SAS. Uh, where you use mixins to create a grid. So it keeps your grid code in, inside your CSS where it belongs. Uh, it doesn't enforce the markup structure. Okay, so all of these are great. You can use whichever you want. Uh, depends on your taste and your needs. Uh, but there's a common problem with all of these. Uh, even though they work great, they have some pretty cool utility classes or mixins that help you create and build grids. Underneath it all, they're using uh, inline blocks, floats, etc. They're not really using some new grid components in CSS. So you're usually limited to the technology that uh, these grid frameworks incorporate, okay? So when you want to do some specific uh, stuff in grids, you're probably gonna pick the grid framework that suits you the most here. And none of, it, none of them cover the whole package. Okay, so I've also seen people lately use Flexbox a lot for grids, and Flexbox is still fresh, it's really cool, and, uh, but it's not really meant for 2D grids. And if you use it to build grids, chances are you'll encounter some problems at one point. So what can we do now about this? Uh, enter CSS grid. So CSS grid is a specification for creating uh, grids in CSS. Uh, it's currently available in most, most browsers, uh, so this is pretty cool because like two months ago when I first did this presentation, uh, it wasn't available almost anywhere. Uh, it was only available in Chrome and Firefox and it was only behind flags. So this is cool. Uh, so now I'd like to delve into some examples of how to use the grid and cover some basics of setting up the grid. So our first uh, example of setting up the grid is gonna be a simple, let's say, a placeholder gallery that we're gonna create here uh, that's gonna look like this. Okay, so now I'm gonna do some live coding. Famous last words. Uh, so let's do this. So, okay, do you see this? Okay, great. Um, do you see the code? Should I, okay. Uh, so this is the markup we're gonna use. Uh, we're gonna have uh, one div with a class of grid. 
uh, that's going to act as a grid container, and all its direct descendants are going to have class, the class uh, grid item, and they're going to be grid items. We're also going to have some boilerplate CSS code that's not really important, it's just to make things prettier and more distinctive. Okay, so let's delve into the setups, setup itself. So this is how it looks now, only using the boilerplate code. So let's create this a gallery from this. Uh, pardon? Okay, so first thing we need to do is set the display property to grid. What this does, uh, it sets a grid context on the grid item uh, or the grid container that we just set the display property on and all its direct descendants. So it overrides most of the display values for its direct descendants in the same vein as, let's say, Flexbox does. Okay? So now we have a grid context. So now let's build the grid itself. So first thing we need to do is set up some columns. Uh, and for this, we have a grid template columns rule. And if you remember our example, we have four columns that are each the same width. So how you do this, let's say that there are going to be 250 pixels wide. So how you do this is you actually write 250 pixels four times. It's really simple. Okay, so now we need to set up some rows. To set up some rows, we use the grid template rows property that acts the same. It's ha it has the same syntax as grid template columns. So we had two rows, right? They are 250 pixels high. Okay, now if we save this, we refresh the site, you can see that we have something that already closely resembles the grid that we wanted. But we have gutters missing. So how are we gonna set the gutters? Uh, where, well, there's a grid gap property that's actually a shorthand for grid horizontal gap and grid, grid vertical gap that sets the gutter width. So let's say that we're gonna have a 20 pixel gutter here. And now if we refresh, we already have the grid. Okay. So this is really the basics. But there's a problem with this. So if we come to smaller screens, we see that this doesn't scale at all. It's not responsive, and responsive is a must for any modern, modern website or application. So how can we do this? Uh, well, of course, we can use some relative units like, uh, let's say, percentage or M's or anything you like here. but. I'd like to talk only about the stuff that's uh, coming fresh with the grid. That's new stuff. So first, one, uh, first thing I want to show you is the min-max function. So we're going to manipulate the further right column. And we're going to use the min-max function that takes up two, two arguments. The first one is the minimum width we want the column to span from. So it's going to be, let's say, 150 pixels. And the second one is the max width. Uh, so it's going to be, let's say, I don't know, 300 pixels. Is that OK? OK. Uh, so now we introduce some responsiveness to the cell. Uh, because of the, much of the free, free space for the grid, it's, uh, it spans to its maximum, pardon, maximum width of 300 pixels. And as you resize it, it resizes itself until its minimum value. OK. So this is cool. Uh, other than this, uh, there's a new unit that's coming included with the grid called fraction. Uh, so one FR or one fraction makes up one fracture, fraction <laughs> fraction of the entire uh, free available space of the grid. So if instead of 250 pixels we put one FR here, the width of the cells is going to uh, take up each one third fraction of the remaining space. So now this grid is fully responsive. OK. Uh, also, there's a cool function that helps you draw out your code and make it less redundant. It comes with a grid called repeat. So instead of just writing one FR three times, which is kind of boring and doesn't look good, uh, we can write repeat, pass the number of times we want to repeat the value that's free, and the value itself. So now we have the same thing we had. OK? Also, uh, one powerful thing that comes with grid is the autofit argument. So if we use the repeat function with autofit instead of the amount of times we want to repeat the value and 
let's say we're going to we're going to pass min max here. Okay, with a minimal value of say 200 pixels and the maximum of one fraction of the free space. Now, when we refresh, we can see that the grid has uh, fit as much as, uh, as much of cells it can in one row. So now, if you resize this, uh, it's going to be smaller and smaller until it hits the minimal value, and then it's going to just go to new rows. So this is pretty cool for galleries. Uh, until you hit a point where it doesn't respect your, rows, your row height anymore. So how can we fix this? So there's a rule for CSS grid called grid auto rows or grid auto columns that takes care of uh, any auto generated columns and rows that your grid generates. So here we want it to respect the value of 250 pixels. Now, if we refresh, you can see that it's so, okay. Cool, uh, just a second. Okay, so this covers the basic setup of the CSS grid. Uh, but what about positioning and order? Uh, there are two types of positioning and ordering in the grid. One is by line numbers or grid lines, and the second one is by grid areas. Okay, so the first one is, in my opinion, better for smaller components such as galleries. Uh, it's by line numbers. So what's a line number? A uh, no, line number describes actually a grid line. A grid line is any dividing uh, line that makes the structure of the grid. And position-wise, it's where you would place a gutter in most grid frameworks. So for, for example, this is the first vertical grid line, the second one, and the third. Uh, it, the same also goes for the horizontal lines. Okay, so for this, we're going to use an example that's almost the same as the gallery we had before with one minor difference. Uh, just a second. So the second grid item is the one that we'll go we're going to manipulate, and it's going to have a special class of special grid item. Uh, and it's going to contain a duck. Okay, so let's go to the CSS. So this is currently not important. It emulates a similar grid as from before. And let's say that we want to uh, make uh, this second grid item to span for two grid, grid columns and two grid rows. So we want to make it twice its size without uh, changing the structure of the rest of the grid. So how we're going to do this? is we're going to use grid column rule and grid row rule. So we're going to pass the grid lines that we want it to span to and from. So we want it to span from the second vertical grid line to the fourth one. So we're going to write this, second slash four. And this works. Uh, if this doesn't work for you, if you don't like grid lines, you can use the span keyword. So if we want it to span from the second grid line for two cells, you just write span two, and it works the same. Uh, OK, and for grid rows, we want it to span from the first grid line to the third one, or the last one. So we're going to do this and this. The syntax is same. And as you can see, it spans accordingly, and the rest of the grid, grid respects this and adjusts itself. So this is some, something that would probably cause, cause you a lot of pain in our green frameworks. Uh, OK, so what about ordering? Uh, there's a rule for ordering called order uh, that works much this, uh, really similarly to, let's say, the way Zindex does. So order defaults itself to 0. And the smaller the number the order rule has, uh, the earlier your grid cell will be in the grid. So let's say we want to move the duck to the first place of the grid. How do we do this? We set special grid item to a small value, let's say 1, and all other grid items to a bigger value, let's say 2. Now if we refresh this, you can see that it's at first place. So 
this covers uh, the basics of line positioning. Uh, now let's go to template area, and this is where things really become cool and powerful, in my opinion. So for this, what's a template area or a grid area? A grid area is any total space surrounded by four grid lines. It's really simple, and it can contain any number of grid cells. Okay, so for this example, we're, we're going to use something a bit different. We're going to create something that uh, resembles a holy grail lay layout. Uh, we're going to have a header, nav, main, sidebar, and footer. Uh, our header is going to be 100 pixels high. Footer is going to be the same. Uh, a side is going to be 150 pixels wide. And nav is going to be responsive. It's going to take one-fifth of the remaining grid. And the main is going to take four-fifths, OK? So let's go to the code. This time we're going to use, uh, just a second. A bit different markup, just to be more, uh, more semantic about this. Uh, we're going to have a layout that's going to be the grid container, and header, nav, main, aside the footer are going to be its grid items. And so we're going to try to recreate this. So if we go to area positioning, CSS, you'll see that we already have a setup for this. Every, each one of the grid items has a grid area rule. What this does, it, it puts labels for each grid area that we can reference later when we'll build the grid, you'll see. Uh, so just for now, remember that nav is going to be called nav, header, header, and, and so on. OK, so to do this, uh, just a second. Let me show you how this looks right now. OK, so this is what we're going to work with. Uh, first, we need to set display to grid, of course. And now let's set our template columns. So for template columns, if you see, now we have a com completely different layout. Let's say that we have three columns that we're going to work with. Uh, the first one is going to span for one fraction of the remaining space. The second one is going to span for four fractions of the remaining space. And the third one is going to have a static width of 150 pixels. OK, uh, so what about the rows? Uh, they're going to be three rows. The first and the last one are going to have a static height of 150 pixels. And the second one is going to span for, its, for the entire free fraction of the grid. So it's like this. OK, so now let's build grid template areas. And this is where the grid area rules come into hand. So what we do now is we literally draw the grid inside this rule. So we have three, three columns in each row. Uh, the first one is covered with header for, the, for its entire width. So we're going to do this. The second one is nav, main, and the side. So this covers the second row. And the last row is entirely made up of footer. So this is it. Uh, and also, we're going to need some gutters to make things look prettier. Uh, so this is it, actually. Now when we refresh, you can see that we have the entire grid set up. It's responsive as we wanted it to be, and this works. As you can imagine, this is really powerful. And if you want to re uh, realign the width on smaller, smaller devices, it's really easy. You just have to change the grid template areas rules and uh, columns and rows, if you wish. OK, so this covers the basics of CSS Grid. There are many other useful properties that you should uh, check out, like this ones that map to similarly to the same named rules in Flexbox that d deal with vertical and horizontal alignment, uh, and also numerous shorthands like Grid Gap and Grid that can help you build grids more effectively. Uh, so where can you use the grid? Well, right now you can use, them for most use it for most browsers. Uh, Edge has plans to ship it soon, so I think it should be available with the next release of Edge. IE has an older implementation of the grid uh, with a prefix. Uh, Auto prefixer actually takes care of this, but the problem is that uh, not all features that are featured in the modern grid are available, available there. Also, Android browser doesn't have support, but in most cases, you're not going to have to 
have a grid on mobile devices anyway. So that's up to you. Uh, okay, so also uh, since CSS Grid is really, really hot now, uh, since it's being released everywhere, uh, a lot of articles have been popping up that can help you uh, learn the CSS Grid more easily. So I came across this. It's called Grid Garden. It's really cool. What this is, is it's actually an interactive game that, uh, that helps you understand the grid layout more easily in a fun and innovative way. You should really check it out. Also, since, since, oh, uh, since, <laughs> since, uh, uh, since uh, other, uh, sorry, since browsers are releasing the grid also, uh, they're updating their dev tools. So you should check out Firefox Grid Inspector, definitely. Uh, also, there are some polyfills. Uh, the most popular one is by Fremi Company. It works, but with a couple of gotchas. So use it if you really need them. So what I want to say is grid is really a powerful way to do good grids in CSS. And the best thing is, is getting integrated in most browsers right now. So uh, you can adapt it early and master it early. Uh, other thing that I'm going to uh, talk about quickly is uh, CSS variables or CSS custom properties. So why to use variables in CSS? Well, they help you better organize your properties and to dry out your code. If you ever use preprocessors, uh, you know that they'll help you with organizing colors, font sizes, etc. cetera. Uh, so this is the syntax of a variable in CSS. So you set the value bound to the, uh, to the root pseudo selector if you want it to be global, and then reference it with the var function that takes the variable name as, as its first argument and the fallback value as its second. So what you might be thinking is how does this compare to preprocessor var variables? Why should I use this if I'm used to SAS or less? Well, the difference is these ones are bound to C CSS selectors and they cascade. So they're scoped only to the scope of, uh, of uh, an element and its children. Also, they can be changed at runtime. So this is where the power lies. Uh, you can access it with CSS or JavaScript at any time. So what this enables is variable changes uh, that are responsive. So let's say you have a grid column gap uh, that you want to change on smaller devices. And if you want it, uh, you can't put any logic here. So you just have to overwrite, or overwrite it with regular CSS here. If you're using CSS variables to do this, you just specify the grid variable, uh, the gutter variable in the root pseudo selector and later reference it wherever you want it to be referenced. Let's say you want a row gap to have, be twice its size, you just multiply it with the calc function. And later, in, on smaller devices, you just uh, reduce it with a media query. Also, it en enables theming, uh, whether it's with JavaScript uh, for the entire website or for some smaller components such as buttons. So let's say you have a button that shares the same color in some places and you want to override it with a dark modifier that uh, just, just changes this color wherever it has to. So in regular CSS, you would do this by hand like this. And with variables, you just set a color, color variable to a value that you want. You reference it wherever, wherever you want. And in the new modifier, you just change the value of the color. And that's about it. Everything else work, works automatically. Also, the most powerful thing is, as I said, you can uh, get and set the variable with JavaScript throughout the whole context. Uh, OK, so I don't have time to talk about current color, unfortunately, but you should check this also. Uh, as browser support goes, it's not featured in IE, but thankfully, it's really easy to write fallback for CSS variables. And to conclude, if they feature need in your boss's support, I see no reason why you shouldn't use them. So thanks.